Hello everybody and welcome back to our fourth seminar in the Ryland's Lunchtime Seminar Series. Um, as repeat viewers know, I'm Guido Armstrong from the Italian Department of the John Ryland's Research Institute at the University of Manchester and I'll be chairing this session for you today. So today's session is coming to you from our audiovisual suite at the John Ryland's Library on Deansgate and we'll be showing some collection objects and presenting new research on them. Our seminar today is on the Bible in West Africa, exploring early missionary translations in Ghana and Nigeria. And it will be presented by Gerardo Serra and Stephen Pierce from the History Department and Jane Gallagher from the John Ryland's Library. So before I um, introduce our speakers, I have a few housekeeping notices as usual. Uh, this event is being recorded and it will be edited and made available on our John Ryland's YouTube channel in due course. Um, auto subtitles are available using your own settings. We're using a Zoom webinar format, which means that your camera and mic is disabled on entry. At the end of the session, we'll have some time for questions. So if you'd like to ask one, please could I ask you to put it in the Q&A function. Uh, you'll find this button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and then I'll select the questions and relay, to, and relay them to the panel. Uh, you can also use the chat function if you have any comments or observations and you can put questions in there as well. We'll be monitoring both channels throughout the talk. Um, we should have time to take a few questions at the end, and we're hoping to wrap up about quarter to one, ten to one. So finally, this is quite a new seminar format for us, and we're very keen to know what you think of it. So at the end, we'll share a feedback survey with you all. So without further preamble, I'll introduce you to our speakers today. First of all, we have Dr. Gerardo Serra, who's a Presidential Fellow in Economic Cultures at the University of Manchester. His research focuses on the history of political and economic discourse and the historical sociology of quantification in 20th century West Africa. And his work has appeared in the Journal of African History, History of Political Economy and Comparative Studies in Society and History. He's currently working on his first monograph entitled Marching with the Times, Economic Knowledge and Political Imagination in Ghana. Presenting the Gerardo is Dr. Stephen Pierce who's Senior Lecturer in Modern African History at the University of Manchester, and he's the Senior Editor for Africa at Comparative Studies of South Asia, Africa and the Middle East. He's published books on land tenure in northern Nigeria, colonial violence and political corruption in Nigeria, as well as articles on these topics and on gender and sexuality. He's currently completing a book on the politics of Islamic criminal law in northern Nigeria and a history of corruption in sub-Saharan Africa. And finally, last but not least, from the library we have Jane Gallagher, Jane is Head of Digital Special Collections and Services at the Rylands, uh, which includes leadership of our frontline services teams, uh, the world leading imaging team and our various groundbreaking digital initiatives. She curates printed religious collections post 1500, including the International Significant Bible Collection. So thank you all very much for speaking to us today and over to you. Thank you very much, Gaida. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to start off with giving you a very brief introduction to the Bible collections here at the Rylands. Uh, so the collection, as Gladys says, is internationally significant. Uh, it's an amazing uh, research resource. The printed section spans about six centuries and more than 400 different languages and dialects. Um, and it is a really important uh, collection for, for international scholarship. Part of the collection includes really early papyri fragments. So for example, the St. John's Gospel fragment, which is the oldest known fragment of the New Testament in existence. Uh, when it comes to English Bibles, we also hold the earliest translations into English from Wycliffe manuscripts and then in print with um, Tyndale New Testaments. But we also have a raft of translations from right around the world, which include things like the uh, first edition of the Bible in Chinese, uh, first edition in Korean, and uh, first edition in Icelandic. So it's a really amazing collection and these translations sort of spread from right from the 16th century all the way up to um, the, the 20th and into the 21st. So obviously uh, the books that we'll be looking at today, they have links with, with missionary um, activities and quite a lot of the 19th century material that we have uh, links into missionary endeavours. So you might wonder why we have this amazing Bible collection here. Well, it's all to do with our founders, uh, who Enriqueta Rylands, who actually set up the library, and her uh, late husband, John Rylands. So both of them were very interested in the study of scripture. They were both Protestant nonconformists, so they felt that the Bible was a really important area of study and a key part of the library for the people of Manchester. So John Rylands actually sponsored biblical scholarship, and uh, Enriqueta Rylands, when she set up the library after her husband's death, made sure that religion was really ingrained into the building. And so the Bible collection we have today stems from that initial interest from them. 
So on to the lovely books. So first off, um, we've got this complete Bible uh, in the Chewy language. Now, as you can imagine, translation is always a political and culturally loaded act. And obviously it's no different with these materials here, but this goes right through from the 16th century uh, Reformation translations into the colonial era. So you can see with this title page here, we've got a bilingual title page. Um, so it's demonstrating that we've got both the English and the Tui language. And within it's solely Tui, and you can see it's quite heavily packed text, very much focused on the word. If I just flip back to the title page, the person who translated it here, this missionary, Cristalia, he um, was involved in a number of translations, some of which uh, he claimed uh, used local input as well. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that a bit later on. So if I just switch over to the next volume I'm going to show you. So you can see, hopefully, that that's quite a large volume. But not all of these translations are, are really significant in terms of size. This is a Hauser um, St. Mark's Gospel. You can see, hopefully, that it's a fair bit smaller than the last item. And when we look at the title page here, you can see that it's not exactly bilingual. Hopefully you can see that, there we go. Um, so we've got the house at the top and then the English publication information at the bottom. And it does also have a little note on the second page here, but it does sort of suggest that the uh, local language has been given precedence here. And again, like with the, the Chewy um, Bible, it's very heavily densely packed text. We've not got space for images or indeed for any kind of um, marginal glosses or explanation on the text. So both the last Bible I showed you and this one uh, were published by the British and Foreign Bible Society. So this was set up in 1804 with the intention of bringing um, the Bible to people who didn't have access to it in their own languages. And interestingly, it actually started with providing access to Welsh language Bibles in affordable format. It, grew, it was a movement that grew out of the uh, Religious Tract Society and also involved William Wilberforce. So it started from a British base, but very soon moved right across the world. So the British and Foreign Bible Society has a very close relationship with the Rylands in its early days. Um, the Rylands opened in 1900, and in May of that year, we took 160 plus volumes from the British and Foreign Bible Society, which includes that um, large Bible that I've just shown you. And then later on in 1916, there was another significant uh, movement of materials, which includes this item, which came into the library. So you can see there is this um, institutional history of links between the Bible, the Rylands and biblical translation. So I'm now just going to switch over to this third edition of the New Testament back to Chewy here, which is again by Cristalia. And this is published in 1878. And Gerardo is going to say a few words. Right. Hello, everyone. I would like to start by thanking the John Islands for, for, for having us. I thank those of you who are listening, and also to thank um, Sok for John and David Daftar, who have been the two research assistants, who really contributed massively to this project. So this is what we're going to present today. is really a series of provisional hypotheses, um, a series of, of, of clues that we've encountered in our um, reading of, the, of this text. So the big question is then, what can we do with these early missionary um, translations? Next slide, please. So clearly, what's the larger narrative here? Uh, it's the centrality of missionaries in the so-called three Cs, uh, through which colonial powers and colonial discourse asserted itself, the combination of Christianity, commerce, and civilization. And from this point of view, I think it's, uh, it's, it's unavoidable to, it's, it's quite obvious that the missionaries did play indeed a huge um, role. However, this being said, and certainly the missionaries still evoke very strong reactions in, uh, in West Africa, and the narratives can be quite polarizing. That's why I put those two pictures there. On the one end, we see the cover of Chima Achebe's Springs Fall Apart, one of the most famous African novels, which is clearly about how the impact of the missionaries 
destroyed the fabric of, 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 of the society. And on top, we have Samuel Johnson, who was a Yoruba missionary who traveled, basically wrote a monumental history of the Yoruba. So by looking at Chilman Chebe and Samuel Johnson, we can see how um, West Africans have used the reflected and experience of the missionary arrival to raise all sorts of questions about themselves, about the world they lived in. So much of the debate is about what the missionaries actually did and how through their intervention, through their activities, they shaped the constructions of the discourse on the 3C, but also they might have favored, so to speak, the implementation and the arrival of colonial, of colonial rule. Here, we take a slightly different point of view. We're interested in a particular aspect of what the missionaries did, which is, of course, a Bible translation. And we're interested in it, or we conceive of it, as a process of conceptual and lexical formation. Now, there's all sorts of um, implications of this. For some of the languages, at least for Chi, that was certainly the case, the arrival of the missionary also um, created a precedent in the sense that the Chi was actually uh, written down for the first time after the arrival of, uh, of the missionaries. At the same time, we should be, we should be wary of, um, of not posing a, a too easy dichotomy between colonial discourse as this totalizing prism of modernity and indigenous language merely as a site of resistance. Um, we are not linguists. Our job is not to comment on the fidelity of the translation, rather is to use the process of translation as a, as a repository of, of clues that we can follow so that we can inscribe the missionary activity within the broader historical uh, context. So there are two concepts that guide us here. The first is that of commensurability, right? We are not, we're not embracing a normative standpoint on the languages involved in this translation as to what is missing, what is lacking. Um, and so rather it's, a, it's about the establishment of regimes of conceptual and semantic equivalence and see what kind of doors are open when we think about it that way. And I think Stephen will say something about that. The second lens is that of performativity. Now, this is something that should be qualified. Obviously, when philosophers of language spoke about performativity, they really emphasized the power of language or translation in this case, not just to describe the word, but actually to remake it, uh, to remake it. Actually here by performativity, we mean something a bit loose. Namely, we ask ourselves, so what is it? What did these Bibles do in terms of allowing us to see things that we wouldn't see otherwise, and that uh, make it easier for us to establish connections between this process of biblical translation and the material context. Although material means quite different things from the angles to which um, Dr. Pierce and I are coming to it. It's not, it's, uh, for me, material mostly consists of the economic in this case. That is what I'm, what I'm, uh, what I'm interested in. Okay, so the translation of the Bible into Qi is uh, um, connected, is uh, the legacy of the Basel Missionary Society. Um, uh, Jane already mentioned Johann Gottlieb um, Christaller. He did indeed rely heavily on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the help and the assistance of Akan uh, people, David Asante and Theophilus Opoku. Uh, so for me, the, the Basel Missionary Society is a fascinating entry point to reflect on one of the three Cs, so to speak, which is commerce or even better, perhaps capitalism. Now, what makes the study of the Basel Missionary Society and the, the Bible translation uh, so interesting from this point of view is that we face lots of contradictions, right? I think it's fair to say that missionaries, colonialism and capitalism were profoundly intertwined. But if we need to ask ourselves, how did that actually happen? And what was the place of this process of conceptual and lexical uh, remaking? Then what we face is a series of contradictory clues. And I'm gonna explore um, some of them. So what is interesting about the Basel Missionary Society is that on the one end, and this is really the opinion of some influential Ghanaian historian, they did carry with them the Protestant ethic of capitalism, which of course is associated with Max Weber. Um, at the same time, they were involved in all sorts of different ventures. On the one end, they were very wary of the degrading impact 
of industrial life on morality. From that point of view, they were almost as anti-capitalist as they could be, if you allow me this, this expression, as we see from that citation there, uh, from one of them. At the same time, they were, um, they were establishing new practices that were somehow um, favoring or articulating the condition for a broader incorporation of Southern Ghana into a capitalist economy. So even though they wanted to create fairly secluded communities in which they could practice education and craft, the very building of this community certainly did contribute to bring more people into the cash economy. Next slide, please. So the first thing that I wanted to do was really to understand the construction of an economic lexicon um, in Chi. And what I was hoping to find, at least something that could have legitimized this close connection between the arrival of the missionaries and the new intellectual order, could have been the possibility to find lots of new words and neologisms. But actually, there was not the case. So that's one of the first avenue uh, we took, was actually to map down all the e recurring economic terms and economic concepts. And from this point of view, there was no much linguistic innovation per se, because Qi already had a very, very extensive vocabulary to think about banking, trade, commerce, um, poverty and wealth. And clearly this is where I think the, the core of the issue is, right? The relation, to, the way in which the Bible rearticulated a new discourse about moral economy, about wealth, about, uh, about poverty. Um, of course, I just, I just have examples here also to show you how some of these words in Qi are actually formed, typically to the aggregation of, uh, of, of simpler and more basic concepts and then putting them together. Um, what I find interesting, because already it makes us find, you know, encounter one of these, uh, one of these contradictions, is that, okay, there, there is such a thing as an idea of capital, it's called J3, which really means the head of the market or market head, but the owner of capital, the only expression that we have for the owner of capital does not coincide at all with our understanding of what a capitalist might be on the one end, because it's the possessor of some little property. It's also interesting how on the one end, and maybe from this point of view, it does uh, resonate with our idea of what a capitalist is. There is this path to expansion. There is this dynamic process. So someone who's not rich, for so that the word would have been Osikani, but rather on the way of becoming so. So there is this kind of interesting aspect here, this interesting nuance as to when we ask ourselves, so how do we translate the owner of capital into cheap? Next slide, please. Certainly what we cannot underestimate is how radically different the moral economy brought by the, the, the gospel was when we compare it with indigenous traditions of thinking about wealth and poverty. And certainly um, Chris Thaler uh, did lots of work in collecting proverbs, which give us a sense of what, was, uh, what were indigenous views on wealth and poverty. And uh, I, I think I don't need to stress already by, by looking at these, how different the moral economy of Christianity is when we compare it with the um, Akan ideas of a very stratified society, lots of proverbs condemning the poor, uh, one that is not here is actually one of my favorites says something like, when the poor makes a proverb, it does not spread. So a sense <laughs> that really says something very, very important about the positioning of the poor within society. There are other proverbs that emphasize the virtues of redistribution and the fact that the rich should care uh, for the poor. So then, if the issue is that um, the Bible brought this new message, even without necessarily creating a new economic lexicon in terms of new words, um, the question though, I mean, I, for, forgive, forgive me for, for the pun, but the devil is in the details, so, so to speak. Um, so the question is, what are the nuances? What are the specific lexical choices that makes us face some of these strange, uh, sometimes contradictory uh, clues when we think of what is the relationship between the lexical and conceptual work done by the missionaries and the creation of a capitalist uh, mentality or its opposite of a moral economy of redistribution that doesn't favor uh, capital accumulation. So just to, just to give you a few examples, this is actually one example of lexical innovation, the introduction of the concept of mammon. What is very unusual though, 
And I'm still not entirely sure what to make of this. We're still working on these hypotheses. Is that this uh, tree translation goes against, uh, I think, many established traditions that always translate this passion, this, pa this passage as emphasizing the dishonest wealth as, as mammon and the true riches, which are the spiritual one. I haven't found, any, and this is certainly true for the Greek from which uh, Chris Taller translated. So there's um, ento adico mammona, the unjust and iniquitous mammon, and the true riches or what is true. So aletinon, right, literally what is true from aletheia, which is, uh, which, which is the notion of truth. And it's very unusual, the fact that he described dishonest wealth as mammona entie, literally unclean wealth, and true riches as no quare mammon. So still using the expression mammon with a positive connotation, which is something that personally I hadn't heard before, but maybe it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just my issue. Then other things, right? Obviously one of the exciting things for working with these sources is that we read what has been written, but we always ask ourselves, what could have been the alternatives to think about specific concepts or specific uh, passages? And uh, another great example, even though it's very subdued, is this in Luke 3.12 said, even the tax collectors came to be baptized. Now, whether that even is translated as also and so, or even po, might have uh, different connotations as to whether, that, as to whether this, that what sets the tax collectors apart within society as both wealthy or sinners comes through or not. And from this point of view, it's tempting to think that by choosing to translate this as also the tax collectors came to be baptized, Chris Taller is perhaps hinting at a more equalitarian message or is hinting at a is gesturing at some egalitarian worldview. So it perhaps given the proverbs I showed you before, one key site of intervention in the missionary translation was to erode or at least make, make less visible the fact that classes are so stratified in society. The last one, and then, and then I'll stop, is the translation in Matthew 10 9. So take no gold, silver, copper in your belts. And uh, the question is, again, if you look at the Greek, uh, we have this sense of do not hold to something, do not bring something. Some people will go as far as they do not pack it, do not bring it with you. And what is interesting here is that they, Chris Taller, chose the expression mompe, which is not do not take with you something you already have, but do not seek, do not even think about it, which clearly raises all sorts of interesting questions as to what is the kind of moral economy that is being promoted uh, here. And I think I'll stop here. I'll leave the word to Dr. Peter. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm afraid there's got to be a somewhat unlovely intermission here. Um, my central interest really is in issues of law and governance. And so when Gerardo and I began working on this project, we were hoping to uh, use the approach that uh, he outlined so beautifully just now to look at these conceptual universes and uh, sort of, of economics and of law and governance and see you know what what traces we can find of them and what sorts of uh, sort of instances of uh, commensuration and sort of cultural sort of co-creation we could see at stake uh, at this moment of biblical translation. The difficulty that my end of the project ran into uh, was simply that uh, the analysis of the House of Language Bible didn't give us anything that was very interesting. Uh, now, there are various reasons for that that I want to go into, but I want to begin by just sketching out some of the empirical context in which uh, the House of Language Bible emerged. Uh, this does become important. So I'm talking about the northern part of the contemporary country of Nigeria, so somewhat uh, to the east and north of the areas of southern Ghana uh, that Gerardo was talking about. Uh, this is an area which has for many, many centuries uh, spoken 
uh, a relatively standardized form of the Hausa language, although, as I'll talk about in a bit, there are dialectical differences. Um, at the beginning of the 19th century, the city-states in this region were conquered by a jihad, which created a vast and almost federated empire. So this empire was called the Sokoto Caliphate. It was ruled uh, from the uh, sort, uh, close by cities of Sokoto and Gwandu, but yeah, Sokoto was the overall capital. Um, however, many of the sort of pre-jihadic city-states such as you know, Zaria, Kano, Katsina, um, and many others retained a certain amount of territorial integrity, but their uh, emirs uh, were selected and confirmed from indigenous royal lineages by the Sultan of Sokoto. Now, at the uh, so toward the end of the 19th century, the missionary effort Gerardo was talking about uh, spread into Nigeria, more or less um, up the Niger River, uh, and uh, outposts uh, began uh, to emerge in the southern uh, reaches of the territory you see on the map. Um, as this process was going on, however, the rulers of the Sokoto Caliphate were uh, quite hostile to the thought of uh, infidels coming into their territories and uh, for various reasons we could talk about more, um, Christianity did not spread very far. Uh, there were some converts in the um, central territories of the Caliphate, but for the most part, um, you know, Christianity uh, was concentrated in areas that had not been centrally ruled by the Sokoto Caliphate. However, at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, a mission station was um, inaugurated in Zaria Emirate. You see Zaria more or less in the middle of that map. And that is the location at which this um, Bible was translated. Now, you know, we were very lucky to have uh, Dr. Sokfa John working with us as uh, our researcher in the Hausa language. Uh, so who not only has a uh, su superb sort of command of uh, and linguistic appreciation for the house of language, but he is also far more sophisticated than I am about Christian theology. One of his initial uh, responses was shock at how alien many of the linguistic choices in this translation of Mark were. So, this translation did not have legs. Many of the sort of constitutive ideas of this project clearly were not going to work out. However, many interesting things also uh, yeah, came up in its stead. And so what I'm going to be talking about in the remainder of my time is how um, aspects of the translation help us to fill in elements of the missionary encounter, which the existing secondary literature has remained more or less silent about. So could I have the next slide, please? Now, um, first of all, I'd like to talk just uh, about some of the very general uh, uh, sort of, uh, aspects of this translation to be noticed. And they are, uh, as we've said previously, this was the Gospel of Mark. Um, one of the uh, sort of elements of this translation that became very obvious was that it was uh, clearly being taken from the King James uh, version of the Bible. And many of the choices were, uh, uh, choices in translation were somewhat peculiar. They were frequently very literal re renderings of the King James language and not uh, sort of theologically um, or textually sophisticated uh, attempts to uh, translate the meaning, um, which, um, you know, as we can talk about later, may say something about the people doing this translation. The um, missionary who oversaw this effort was a man named Walter Miller, uh, who later on in his career was uh, extraordinarily fluent in Hausa. At this moment, 
uh, there are some reasons to think his household was not yet so good, but there were clearly uh, Nigerian uh, sort of informants who were making a number of these choices, but it, you know, there are very, uh, their command of Hausa and their command of English um, you know, can be, I think, revealed by some very fine-grained analysis of the text. Um, it is likely that the, uh, you, uh, the, the main Hausa translator was perhaps not centrally culturally Hausa, very frequently attempts to render sort of constructions from the Bible uh, in local terms were highly artificial. Um, so it's possible that the, uh, the informants, uh, the translators, uh, Hausa was not fully fluent uh, and many of the customs may have been alien uh, to him. Now, one particularly interesting aspect was that there was a recurrent use of Sokotanchi, which is a subdialect of Hausa spoken in the extreme west of the Caliphate, which is not the dialect of Hausa, which was being uh, spoken in Zaria. But one of the interesting aspects of this is that um, Sokotanchi was not being used consistently. So something very peculiar is going on with the dialectical command. Perhaps there were several translators, uh, but uh, it seems likely that this was a person who had spent times in different areas of Hausa land. Uh, one interesting aspect uh, of the translation is that Jesus is consistently called Isa, uh, the Arabic form of, uh, of Jesus. Uh, Jesus, of course, uh, is uh, understood as a prophet in Islam. Uh, so the, this was um, uh, not an unreasonable decision. However, uh, Arabic speaking Christians tend to call him Yesu and in subsequent translations, that is the rendering of Jesus that gets used in house of language Bibles. Uh, many, um, uh, many terms do get borrowed from Islam. One of the most notable is that temple uh, and synagogue get, re uh, uh, get rendered as Masalachi. Um, which you know, is not rendered by sort of today's standard orthography. Um, yeah, but that, that's the household language term for mosque. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, I, you know, to go very quickly through uh, a few uh, observations about the text, um, what, what I'm really going to do is make fun of some of the household language translation choices. So, um, you know, which are, I think, quite telling about the missionary encounter itself. So looking at uh, the rendering of uh, Mark 2, verse 10, uh, so the rendering of, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. What is interesting about this is the choice of the word sarauta uh, to render authority. Sarauta is... Uh, not the natural word to use. Sarauta, uh, so Sokfa suggested that uh, it might be more gracefully rendered as crown, as in you know, the crown of England, but that's not quite right either. Uh, it's more like an office. So the vice chancellor of the University of Manchester uh, was turbaned with the Sarauta of the University of Manchester. She then gave the Sarauta of the Deanship of the Faculty of Humanities to Keith Brown, so on and so forth. There's a whole series of these offices. So um, yeah, there is another very natural word for um, authority that might be used. In fact, it is used in my next verse, Mark 3:24. Um, if you see there, uh, oh yes, uh, the Murki Bashida Iko Shitsaya. So Iko uh, means more power. That would be the natural choice of word. So um, bracket for a moment this use of Sarauta. In the second one, the use of Murki to, um, uh, uh, to signify kingdom is extremely interesting. Again, a very odd word choice. Uh, Mulki means something like regime or government. 
Um, kingdom would be naturally oh, um, re rendered as um, casa, uh, perhaps. So um, what I would suggest with both of these uh, is that um, you, these are highly artificial translations, but if you map them onto current events going on in Zaria at precisely the time of this translation, and we can talk some about this in the Q&A session if you would like, um, you know, I think that these translation choices actually do suggest an appreciation of current affairs, which might have given this translation legs. Um, let me skip over these uh, last two to the, that um, uh, chapter 10 verse, verses six to eight is a little bit funny um, when it says that uh, in the end, the, the two shall become one flesh. The house of language version says the two shall become one meat. Um, okay, uh, can I, we just have the last slide very quickly. Um, I don't have time fully to develop these points. Uh, but let me suggest that many of the linguistic oddities of uh, the translation suggest that the translator was most likely a foreigner and very likely a slave. This maps onto uh, elements of the uh, missionary encounter in many places in Africa that would you know, uh, bring the Zaria mission into line with uh, other locations, we do not have documentation for this in the area. And therefore, it seems to me that sort of my end of the project is suggesting to us a whole new range of methodologies for reconstructing uh, perspectives on the missionary encounter, which up until this point have been largely lost to history. So thank you. Okay, so. Okay. Thank you all for that fantastic, really rich, really interesting presentation. Um, I think we have about 12 minutes for questions. So look at you all lined up there. <laughs> um, I've got the, we've got a question already. Uh, the first question is for, uh, for Gerardo. Um, do you feel like the way in which the Chi translation by Cristala speaks about wealth and capital may have shaped some of the economic tensions that led to the rise in witchcraft accusations in the 20th century? That's, that, that's a fantastic question, because I think the witchcraft accusations are yet another very powerful site to understand what the articulation of a moral economy is in the late 19th century and in the early 20th century. We haven't gone as part of the project yet as to suggest anything so directly. So the truth is that I don't know yet, but it's one of the things that I really hope to, to, to find out. But I certainly see Bible translation and witchcraft accusations as part of this emerging constellations of new discussion as to what counts as wealth and capital and what is legitimate wealth versus legitimate wealth and what it comes from. I'll let you know once I find out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we've got another question here. Um, is there any influence of or, or relevance to the missionaries to Far East or South America uh, in much earlier time? So would the search of spices, of, of, of the search for spices of food in the 16th century, might that also be related to capitalism, making more money and wealth? And is there any comparison you could make between South Africa and West Africa? So I guess any or all of you for that one. I think you should start. Yes, well, um, absolutely. I mean, in the sense that uh, I must say, I've been looking at a bit of the literature on, uh, on South America and the Far East, uh, mostly because some of the most refined historical methodologies to deal with missionary translations come from there. Now, the question of the place of capitalism in that is something that should be brought a bit more into the, into the, in, into the core issue. I completely believe that there is, um, that there, there is a, a, fundamental, a fundamental issue. Comparison between South Africa and West Africa. I would like to look at some more material before, before establishing uh, some of that. Um, if anything, the point of this project was to take 
the opposite approach to take a very grand narrative and take like almost a micro history of a very specific language and see how it can subvert this but certainly it would be amazing to have more people coming here and work on some of these collections. there's lots actually of south african uh, bibles that are way to be to be looked at i don't have the linguistic or historiographical skills for that yet but. I, I i think one thing to be said about that is that um we would pr probably want to be you know, very precise about a whole range of Bibles, e even from earlier, uh, because uh, there was, in fact, a great deal of mercantile activity around the West African coast. Uh, in fact, from before the time of the Cape uh, settlement in the mid 17th century. So um, I, I think that a project which was really trying to um, engage with, you know, long durée uh, sort of questions of the conceptualization of capitalism yeah. would need to embed uh, them into, you know, what, what's already, of course, a very well developed sort of uh, global history of mercantile activity all around uh, the African coastline. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a question here for Stephen from Georg Christ. Um, it, it's quite it's quite telegraphic, so I shall try and translate it for you. He says, he says mm -hmm. Stephen, different layers and registers of language, i.e., one more Arabizing, explaining use of Isa, Mulki, etc. Yeah, um, you know, Georg, absolutely yes. Um, now it is worth saying that about forty percent of uh, the modern house of languages vocabulary comes directly from Arabic. Uh, there has been a long-term systematic influence of Arabic, and in fact, it is possible to um, sort of disaggregate sort of different stages of loan words into Hausa. Um, th this is something that Sokfa and I need to talk about more. He um, pointed out that in uh, among more recent uh, Hausa Christians, the tendency is to refer to Jesus as Isa when they are being conciliatory toward uh, the Muslim majority. Uh, and Yesu is used uh, uh, for intra-Christian um, sort of discussions uh, and also at times when um, people are making the point that the Christian uh, Jesus is, um, you know, is in fact God uh, as well. So, uh, but, you know, you are absolutely right. At the same time, um, many of the sort of nuances that we see at play in the Bible don't seem to be sort of highly considered um, and precise use of nuance, but rather um, possibly telling clumsiness. Thank you. Um, I have a question actually, and it's my question. Um, so I just wanted to, yeah, I was struck that you're talking about doing kind of micro histories, but I wonder if we could make it really micro and talk about the book object, the artifacts for a little bit. Um, there, I was really struck when you showed us the Bibles, Jane, that, you know, they're really, in terms of sort of design, in terms of the page design, the mise en page, they are absolutely centered in their kind of sending production context. You know, these are really kind of like, you know, 19th century European books. Is there ever a kind of gesture towards the audience in terms of the page design or, you know, or something about the kind of hierarchies of the relationships between the languages as expressed on the page, you know, perhaps with parallel text or fonts? Is there anything like that that you can tell me about? Yeah, that's a really good question, Guy. I'm, I'm going to be honest, indeed, the, the quick answer is no, not really. Um, it's basically just the translated text crammed in. So thank you very much. Uh, we've only got two microphones, so we're just ad-libbing. Um, so in terms of the large Bible that I showed you, that one is the one with the bilingual um, title page, and the New Testament as well also has a bilingual title page. It has the local language at the top and then the English at the bottom. Um, and then other than that, it's just in the local language. So it's very much, it seems to me, about cramming in the text, focusing on the text and that direct translation without any of the um, paratext or anything else really to guide the reader through. Um, and I think that speaks really nicely to what we've been hearing from Stephen and Gerardo about the importance of that translation. And I think that's really where the, um, the nuance comes in, which wasn't included 
very obviously in the physical item, but it's all there. It's just in the text rather than in the design is my impression. Now, I, I, I'd really like to hear what Gerardo has to say about uh, the, the treat version because um, in the sort of Hausa uh, version, I mean, in fact, this is quite innovative uh, in that until exactly this period, Hausa was not being written in Roman script or um, sort of in this format at all. So uh, while there is a very longstanding literary tradition, that tradition uh, was one of handwriting and calligraphy. It was using Arabic script, uh, both in Arabic and in how so uh, rendered in, uh, in the Arabic and in adapted Arabic script. So uh, I don't see any sort of elements taken from that very well uh, developed uh, tradition, although in part that is likely because the target audience for the missionaries was exactly not the literate uh, uh, audience consuming um, the written literary culture of uh, uh, the Sokoto Caliphate. But, yes. uh, but yeah, Asante is clearly such a difference. Yeah. No, but, but still, I mean, actually I'd like to pick up on uh, on your point of who the target audience for missionary mm -hmm. intervention, who the, who the target audience for missionary um, intervention was. And certainly, I think there is much truth in the fact that the very earliest converts were not the elites. Or even when they were, like in the case of David Asante, they were excluded from something. In this case, because of the matrilineage system, he could, right? so <laughs> there is a sense. You of explain that. Uh, no, there's no time. <laughs> it's, uh, so so th th there is a sense, that's why I think that this emphasis on the so-called moral economy is so important, right? This is why there's such a key discursive articulation of this issue of who is poor, who is rich, and, 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 what, and what that means. Uh, there is a whole another um, layer that we didn't have time to get into, which is the ways in which the Qi Bible incorporates a can words for different positions in society. So for example, different words to define slave and whether there's stratification even within that, if it's the house servant or the slave, say, you know, uh, or the, the, the distinction between the strong man, the noble, the wealthy, and obviously even though these words have a long history, the persons that were associated with them changed dramatically in much of Akan history. So in the case of, of Asante, for example, the big, Transformation is that you know, in the, in, say in the in the 18th century, the 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 um, the, the, Pond, the strong man tend to be something who distinguished himself in military enterprises, and then he shifts. He becomes more uh, compatible with the accumulation of wealth. So over time, so there is this very interesting uh, shift here at which the Bible in, in, intervenes. Thank you. I mean, there's, you know, you've just opened up so much for us. I hope you'll come back and talk to us again about it more in more detail, you know, in our next round, perhaps. Um, I'm going to have to stop it there, unfortunately, because we're coming to the end of our time. So once again, I'd like to thank all three of our speakers. I'd like to thank the audience for their excellent questions. Um, and I'd also like to thank our tech teams as well, who've been sort of tirelessly running this off camera. Um, next week's seminar will be at 12 p.m. on the same link, and it will feature Kerry Pimblot and Maya Sharma, whose talk and their talk is entitled Drawing on Special Collections to Explore Black Community Formation in Manchester during the 19th and early 20th centuries. So you can find more details about this on the What's On page on the Rylands website. Um, and I think you, you can register from there to get the Eventbrite link again. And I think we'll put the links in the chat here as well for you. So thank you all again for joining us. A virtual round of applause for everybody. And we hope we'll see you all again next week.